This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. In the 19th century, they played a key role in America's coastal defense and gained fame during one of the most important naval battles of the Civil War. Since that time, they have stood strong in the face of hurricanes and tropical storms. They are the historic forts of Mobile Bay. And if you happen to find yourself along Alabama's beautiful Gulf Coast, you'll discover them right in your own backyard. The War of 1812, the capital was burned. Uh, the British were able to land on the East Coast pretty well anywhere they wanted. Because of this, because of the, the, the inability of the American forces to stop the British at these places, it was decided to build the first comprehensive coast defense system. And this system is the longest running system that the Corps of Engineers ever worked on. It started around 1817 and was not finished by the time of the beginning of the Civil War. And you find forts of masonry type all the way from the coast of Maine all the way to California. It was a different time. We, we didn't have a, um, a large standing army. The United States had a very small army at the time, didn't have a large standing navy. Uh, so it was decided that oceans were almost like a moat. And this was almost like a, a screen, a, a masonry screen, if you want to call it that, that would protect the coast from any invading army. Fort Morgan was named in honor of the Revolutionary War hero, Daniel Morgan. It was built in the shape of a five-pointed star, and experts consider it one of the best examples of military architecture in North America. It's a, uh, an example of classic French military architecture. Uh, it was designed by a French military engineer uh, who was, uh, came over from France after uh, Napoleon was, was exiled and served with the Corps of Engineers uh, as a Brigadier General for um, almost 25 years. And he helped, he designed this fort. So it's got examples of classic military, French military architecture. When the Army built it, it's really only expected to be used for about 50 years or so. Um, these structures, as massive as they are and as much labor as went into building them, uh, they're actually expendable. Fort Morgan, one of the main problems that it has had since its original completion, uh, each one of these rooms, uh, the casemates that we're standing in, they're supposed to be uh, dry. Um, however, they constantly have had water seeping through and things of that nature, especially after heavy rains as uh, we've had recently. On the east side of the fort, they actually um, just finished a restoration there where they took everything off the top of at least one of these casemates, a massive amount of soil and such that's on top, uh, removed the brickwork things, went down to find out what the problem was. Um, and attempt to fix it in a modern way. So when, once that was completed, they rebricked the top of the fort, uh, rebuilt the breast height wall that is over there, uh, and actually that section of the fort looks as it would have during the time of the Civil War. Anytime you have a structure like this um, exposed to the elements, um, you, you're going to have to have you know constant restoration going on. So Paul, you were um, talking about the restoration. Mm -hmm. And recently you had some restoration and came across something rather interesting, I uh, understand. Yes, uh, actually during the restoration process, uh, well actually during the excavations prior to the restoration, uh, they actually found a 100 pounder parrot shell. Um, when I say parrot shell, that's a particular type of um, artillery piece, a cannon, uh, used by the Navy, um, specifically in this case the Federal Navy. Um, and so it's a 100 pounder shell, weighs 100 pounds. Uh, and it was an explosive shell. It was explosive. It was live. Still live. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh -huh. Actually, we were actually able to narrow it down to about the date that it was fired into the fort, which would be in July 1864. And so it was found uh, just up here. There's a small niche where a gun position was for one of the casemates. And so when it was fired uh, on July 4th, 1864, um, it basically nosed in, um, came in point first either buried itself and snuffed out the fuse on the inside, oh. or for some other reason it just failed to detonate. Um, so of course once uh, it was found, we immediately sent it off, had it deactivated. Uh, and we currently house it now and plan on putting it on the exhibit soon. So do we need to watch our staff around here? Uh, no, you should, you should be safe. It's uh, very rare that we actually come across a piece of live ordnance and stuff. Occasionally though, you will find pieces of uh, fra uh, shrapnel fragments and stuff. Um, but generally, uh, it's, a, it's a rare event when we find a complete artillery shell. Very interesting and very much history alive, right? Oh yeah, most definitely. <laughs> 
Fort Morgan's history is showcased at the museum that stands just outside the fort's walls. Displays and exhibits interpret military life, as well as the maritime heritage of the region. Among the treasures you'll find at the Fort Morgan Museum are lenses from Mobile Bay's lighthouses. This spectacular 10-foot tall Fresnel lens was removed from the Sand Island Lighthouse in 1971. Well, the museum, uh, it, we have the lighthouse section which kind of stands off on its own and then basically you will see a chronological order of exhibits that will take you all the way from the War of 1812 uh, through to World War II when this post was actually, the fortification was actually last used for military defensive purposes. And th that will include uniforms, artifacts, uh, and we, uh, we have a very interest, interesting though kind of grisly exhibit on Charles Stewart who was once commander of the fortification here. Um, who regrettably lost his life here um, during uh, the testing of an artillery piece. The Civil War history of Fort Morgan begins in, in January 1861. Uh, it seized one week before Alabama secedes from the Union. The fort was um, held by the state of Alabama until March 1861 when it was turned over to Confederate forces and it became a Confederate fort. Its main role during this time was to uh, protect the interest to Mobile Bay. Blockade runners were running from Cuba uh, on a regular basis, and the Union blockade was out in the, in the Gulf to keep them from coming through. So the fort's role was to make sure that any of these blockade runners trying to get into Mobile Bay would have a safe haven once they got to the mouth of the bay, that the fort would protect them, the, the carrying cargoes, essential cargoes for the Confederacy. And that was his role all the way until uh, August 1864. Mike, it's so quiet now, the stillness is just so overwhelming, but I hear that quite a lot happened in this particular area. Oh yeah, it, it, it did. Uh, August 14th was the pivotal day of the, the siege of Fort Morgan in 1864. Uh, General Richard Page, who was commanding officer of the fort, determined that the best place to put the garrison would be in the, in the flank bastions. About 9.15 in the morning of August 14th, there were 45 men of the 1st Tennessee Heavy Artillery inside 45 this room. 45 in 45. this small room? 45 in this small room. So you can imagine conditions. It's August, it's hot, oh. it's dark. Uh, you're in here thinking this would be the, the, a, a place of refuge. This right. would be a place of protection. Well, about 9.15 in the morning, the USS Manhattan, uh, which was the sister ship of the Tecumseh, which had, went down, which had gone down earlier in the battle, uh, was laying about 1,500 yards off the end of the engineer's wharf and was bombarding the fort, just randomly about every 30 minutes firing a shot. About 9.15, a 15-inch shell came through the wall right up here. 15-inch? 15-inch shot, the shell, that explosive shell, uh -huh. came directly through the wall right here, blew through the wall and exploded right in the top as it came through. Dismounted both of the artillery pieces that were here, mounted here in the room, and killed uh, two of the men of the 1st Tennessee Heavy Artillery, uh, injured several others around the, the head and neck, uh, and one died later on. But this is the pivotal day. Prior to the 14th, the garrison had thought they could actually hold out. There was, there was an attitude that we've got supplies, we've got a strong fort, we'll be able to hold out. But after the 14th, the morale of the garrison goes down. They know now that no place inside this fort is safe that the Union Navy, with the large, powerful artillery that th the ships have, can punch holes right through the brickwork here. So they realize no, no place is safe. So the attitude of the garrison goes down that we, instead of holding out, being able to hold out, they know they're going to be captured. Eventually, they're going to be captured. So um, they hold out for another nine days. But they realize that the end is going to come soon. So that but, seems to be the pivotal yes, moment. Yes, that is the pivotal, the pivotal moment of the siege is when these rounds come through the walls of the fort here and explode on the interior of this room. Very disheartening. And as armament and weaponry and such changes um, throughout the centuries, the Army has to keep up with that. And what they end up doing is building these massive reinforced concrete batteries inside of these fortifications, uh, which are termed Endicott batteries, named after the Secretary of War at the time. And these batteries uh, basically are, to some extent, are going to incorporate um, the original structure. Um, so here at Fort Morgan, uh, in the center of the fort, we have Battery Dupertel. Um, and as you can see behind me, it's actually poured in underneath the walls. And to help bomb-proof uh, that uh, concrete battery, 
they actually fill a number of the rooms with sand on the inside um, so that when a round comes in, uh, it actually is going to have a soft impact instead of hitting directly against the concrete wall. Of course, this is a mouth to a bay, and with the coastal islands, of course, we have uh, the tidal current is carrying the sand westward stuff, and so you end up with the shipping channel here shifting um, throughout its history. And so that necessitated the building of lighthouses here at the mouth of Mobile Bay. And so they end up building Sand Island Lighthouse uh, three miles offshore on Sand Island. Now with Mobile Point Light, um, the brick lighthouse, original brick lighthouse that stood there, uh, it essentially was in the way. It set in the middle of an artillery battery and it inadvertently becomes a target of war. Um, even though of course we think of lighthouses as these great beacons of peace and hope and things and something reassuring, um, it's set in the middle of an artillery battery uh, and it's actually the artillery battery that first opened fires on Farragut's fleet as they entered the bay. Uh, and so as the battle begins to rage and becomes more general, naturally the lighthouse is going to be shot up. One of the things is the, the collective stories that you have of the individuals that were here. And bringing their stories together is the, the whole story of Fort Morgan. Uh, whether it's a, a, a slave that worked on construction of the fort, whether it was a soldier that was here in the early days of the fort, one of the Confederate or state troops that came in here in 1861, or even uh, families that were here in the modern era after 1900. We're their voice, we tell their story. It's our responsibility to do that. We, they're not here, so we tell their story. And to me, it's very special that we remember these people, to remember the sacrifices that they made in the defense of this country. First of all, you, you come down, it's a beautiful area in general. Uh, then you have this massive structure uh, which is architecturally a beautiful thing to see. Um, but then you also have uh, the, uh, an evolution of history. And to be able to come to the sites, um, to see them, uh, it, you really get a, a finer appreciation for what happened in the past uh, and what we have today and what we need to do to take care of it. Three strategically placed forts, Morgan, Powell, and Gaines, defended Mobile Bay. Nothing remains of Fort Powell, but Fort Gaines is very much intact. Although threatened by coastal erosion, it's considered one of the best preserved masonry forts of the Civil War era. Fort Gaines is located on Dolphin Island, on the western side of Mobile Bay. To get there from Fort Morgan, you'll save yourself a two-hour drive if you take the ferry boat. It's a real peaceful, a uh, calm experience for people to ride a ferry all the time. HMS Global Maritime would like to welcome you aboard the Fort Morgan Ferry for a 35 minute cruise across the Mobile Bay. The Mobile Bay Ferry runs like clockwork, making multiple crossings daily. It carries cars, bicycles, motorhomes, pickup trucks, pedestrians, even boats on trailers. Contractors, commuters, and other regulars are known as frequent floaters. For those visiting both coastal forts, the ferry crossing is a highlight of the trip. Well, you'll see a lot of uh, ships coming in and out, and we have the, the cruise ship that comes in and out, and you'll see a lot of sea life. Uh, dolphins, schools of fish, uh, crabs on the pilings, things like that. But you will see a lot of dolphins in the late summer. You get people all the time that's never been on boats before, and they always tell you this is the first time they've ever been on a boat. And that, I mean, it cuts off a lot of travel time, you know, taking the interstate and the bayway and uh, going through the tunnels and stuff. I mean, it cuts off a lot of time, especially if you're coming from Dolphin Island to Gulf Shores, everything's right within 20 miles when you get off the ferry. And they can just ride the coast and just, just to get out of the house and have a peaceful, quiet ride. It's our first time and we loved it. It was a fun experience. Well, it was great. We pulled up. We waited our turn to get on and uh, it's a fun way to cross uh, the, uh, the bay and we're looking forward to exploring Dolphin Island a little more. History comes alive at Fort Gaines through a variety of reenactments, both military and civilian. The harsh effects of sun, salt and seawater took a heavy toll on coastal fortifications. Rust and corrosion were constant enemies and the fort's blacksmith was the best defense against them. Today, there's a smith on staff. The job of the blacksmith at Fort Gaines at this time period was to manufacture and maintain tools and hardware. No weapons or ammunition, but the items that are necessary to keep the fort operational. Axes, shovels, rakes, 
picks, different carpenter tools, masonry tools like trials, hinges, door pulls, locks. Some of the tools that we use are drills that make holes, vices we use to hold on to our work, hammers we'll be using to shape with, an anvil is what we shape on, punches, chisels used for cutting and marking. The handle I'll be pulling on is attached to a set of airbags we call a bellows. It helps to increase the temperature of the fire to approximately 4,000 degrees. A lot of us have seen the bellows around our fireplaces, a small hand pump bellows. It's single chambered. This is a two chambered bellows, a bottom set of airbags and a top set of airbags. So when I pull the handle, I'm filling up the top airbag and it slowly pushing back down, giving me a steady stream of air instead of a puff, puff, puff type fire, which is just not gonna burn as hot. Coal is the fuel that I burn. As the steel increases and decreases in temperature, its color changes. I use those colors to determine the temperature. So we have shades of orange first. Hot, but not hot enough to work. What I'm looking for is a bright orange to a yellow color. It's approximately 2,000 degrees and gives me a minute's worth of work time. The demonstration we'll be doing first is making nails. So slow to make nails in this fashion, they would burn down old structures to get them back and reuse them. So I hammer and turn. I got interested in this trade when I came to Fort Gaines in 1989 for the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Mobile Bay. And there was an old blacksmith over here doing demonstrations. It looked like it was fun to do. I think the biggest part of the curiosity is the fire. The high temperatures that you work with, the colors in the metal, cooling it off like that is always a wow factor to the younger person and then be able to take it and bend it into a shape. And then a usable shape, they also find that interesting as well. This is where we'll be breaking it off on the next heat to form its head. If you were the nail maker in the shop, instead of using one bar at a time, you would use several. So while you're working one, the other one's getting hot. Through multitasking, it is said they would average about one nail a minute. <laughs> the next step, putting the head on the nail, we use a tool called a header. Generally, this was the job of the apprentice in the shop. In your early shops, would have averaged an age of about eight to 10 years old. Cool it. It can be touched, straightened, and we have one nail. The round nail making machine, what we know of as modern nails today, was invented in the 1890s in England. So that's when nails start to become affordable. So just a simple square nail. Now, I burned coal, and they would have burned coal here as well, because of how long it lasts. If I was using a charcoal fire, there's about a 10 to 1 burn ratio between coal and charcoal. So this bucket of coal here is about 15 pounds of coal. It'll last me about eight hours. If I was burning charcoal, you would need 10 times that weight to do the same job. So coal is a dirty fuel source. But what it is that makes it so useful, it's very efficient. That's one of the things right there that I get asked to do all the time, cool it off in the water. So depending on the age group, I could just heat things up and cool it off in the water and they think that's cool. Fort Gaines Ranger staff helps modern day visitors understand what everyday life was like for Civil War soldiers 150 years ago. 
Uh, my name is Joseph Everett, a park ranger here at Fort Gaines. Uh, the outfit that I have on is that of a Confederate soldier that would have been stationed here at Fort Gaines during the war between the states. Now, the equipment that I carry is actually standard gear of a Confederate soldier of the time period. I have cartridge box, cap box, I have a musket, 1853 infield type musket, I have canteen and haversack for carrying my food in, also a bayonet for the musket. Now, where we're at, we're at uh, Fort Gaines historic site and Fort Gaines is actually known for the Battle of Mobile Bay, actually participating in part of the Battle of Mobile Bay. Uh, the features that you're actually seeing behind me, we have a ramp over here which was for moving the ammunition to the guns on top of the fort. Uh, tunnels going to the bastions were from the parade ground here and bakery over here. Latrine, actual soldiers had a latrine inside the fort here and workshops which you actually can hear a blacksmith over there hammering on different things he's working on. Now the fort actually was used until 1923. So the turn of the century, they actually came into the fort and modernized the fort. Concrete structures, the Endicott structures in the, in the fort were actually constructed between 1898 and 1904. Uh, quartermaster buildings, uh, our museum in the fort is actually housed in part of the old Endicott system. And over here on this side over here, we actually have officers quarters and behind the officers quarters you actually have the officers kitchen areas which in the officers kitchen areas there are several casemates back there that actually have storage areas and fireplaces ovens you know equipment like that for the officers cooking needs this piece actually is a 32 pound seacoast gun model 1829 this was actually poured in the 1830s this is actually one of the guns that they used during the Battle of Mobile Bay. This particular piece itself was not sitting here. This is actually on top of one of the bastions now. Originally, it was actually mounted over here on the south wall in one of the gun emplacements over there. This fort actually here, uh, before the fleet actually comes into the bay, is already under siege. They've been under siege for a day. And then the morning of the 5th, Farragut brings the ships in and once those ships are in then everything is going to actually turn and they're going to have you know ship firing into the fort also so it actually was was uh, you know army and navy engagement of the forts uh, this fort actually being attacked by the army first and then once it is captured then the whole attention of the, ba of the uh, actual Battle of Mobile Bay will turn to Fort Morgan and then the Army will dig trenches in there and, and attack and capture Fort Morgan also. Unlike Fort Morgan, when it was originally constructed, Fort Morgan had no latrines in the fort. Construction on this fort actually included latrines in the fort. Unusual, they also flushed. They had a way of flushing the latrines. Let's take a look at these. And these are the latrines. Um, when you noticed, we have a wooden bench with holes in here. Uh, pit down below the deck here actually was nine feet deep. We have the pit actually filled in with, with uh, sand for safety purposes, but the pit is actually where everything would go. And to flush the latrine, you actually use the tide. High tide would bring water into the pit, and low tide would actually take what was waste out of the pit. Well, this small anchor that we're standing beside right here actually is one of the anchors off of Farragut's flagship, the Hartford. Uh, actual weight of this anchor is actually 7,000 pounds. And the chain links, each chain link on this thing is actually 25 pounds per chain link. So there's a little bit of weight on, on this piece. Uh, and, and as I said, this is actually the one of the anchors off of the Hartford, the flagship of Farragut when he came into the bay. With its clash of ironclads and the volleys fired by sailing ships, it would be difficult to recreate the deafening din of the Battle of Mobile Bay. But Park Ranger Joseph Everett can provide at least a small scale demonstration. This particular piece here is a 12 pound mountain howitzer. 
Uh, this is our demonstration piece here at the fort. This is the one that we actually use for firing for the public, you know, at, at, you know when they visit the fort. Now, what I'm using in here, what I'm actually firing is half of a normal service charge for this, for this piece. Uh, a full service charge was half of a pound of powder. A half of a service charge actually is just a quarter of a pound of powder. There is no projectile in the gun, so it's a blank. We're not going to hurt anybody. But if we take that and we compare it to a 32 pounder, a 32 pounder actually used eight pounds of powder to fire in one shot. Fire in the hole! To get to Fort Morgan, you can take either Gulf Beach Highway or Interstate 10 to Highway 59, then follow Fort Morgan Road to the tip of the peninsula. To drive to Fort Gaines, follow Dauphin Island Parkway south from I-10. To travel from fort to fort, the Mobile Bay Ferry runs several times a day, seven days a week. We hope you've enjoyed this look at two of the Gulf Coast's most significant historic landmarks. We'll see you again next time, right in your own backyard.